Uh, before we kick things off, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kyler Headland, um, and I work as an administrator for the Center for Cartoon Studies in White River Junction, Vermont. Um, and uh, I also teach their uh, visiting artist class, um, and I will be our moderator today. Um, so I'm going to leave some time for audience questions at the end, so please uh, think of some stuff for the last 15 minutes here. Um, and uh, now I'm going to pass it along uh, to Justin. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. sure. Uh, my name is Justin Hall. I'm the chair of the MFA in Comics program at California College of the Arts. Um, I've been teaching comics for over a decade um, and making comics for much longer than that. Uh, there was um, indoor plumbing when I started making comics, but that was probably that. <laughs> But it, um, and uh, yeah, I've taught in other places as well, um, at uh, TAW, which I th believe is represented here as well, and um, uh, in different countries. So I was a Fulb first Fulbright Scholar of Comics, so I, I taught comics in American comics in uh, Czech Republic. Um, I've taught them in Thailand and other places in Europe, so yeah. Hi, I'm Lauren McCubbin. I'm the chair of Comics and Narrative Practice at Columbus College of Art and Design in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, our program has been going on for about six years, um, and before it was part of illustration. Um, I, too, have been doing comics since indoor plumbing. Um, I think, as a matter of fact, Justin and I started yes. right about the same time in right about the same place, so in the Bay Area. Um, and uh, I've also, um, uh, uh, I did a long time ago, I did a book called Rent Girl. Uh, I kind of focused more on comics production. Uh, I was the art director for Image Comics. I was the managing editor for Shoujo Beat at Viz. Um, that always gets squeals from my students, much less manga fans here, I guess. And then, OK, good, yeah. Uh, and um, that's all I got right now. Go ahead. <laughs> Hello, I'm Daryl Seichik, and I'm a freelance traveling teacher. Um, so I'm not affiliated with any one institution, but closely affiliated with the Center for Cartoon Studies. I teach at like six or seven different places at a time to people of all ages, and I've been doing it for almost a decade now. Um, I'm an LLC. <laughs> um, and I'm also a, a cartoonist. I've been practicing for even longer than I, I'm drawing comics than I've been teaching them, obviously. Uh, and uh, I run a small press called Parsifal Press with my partner. And um, I teach people of all ages. So the youngest person I've taught is four. It's really hard to teach for, uh, comics to a four-year-old. And uh, the oldest person I taught is like 90-something. So yeah, all ages. Hi, my name is Emma Johnson. Um, I'm an Australian cartoonist based in Gainesville, Florida, with the Sequential Artist Workshop, or SOAR. Um, we're a nonprofit school and arts community founded by Tom Hart, who you may have been expecting to hear from today. <laughs> um, my background is in creative writing, and I came to SOAR as a student in 2018, and I've been working with them since that. Hey, everybody. I'm Jason Little. Uh, I'm the comics coordinator at the School of Visual Arts in New York City. I've been teaching at SVA since 2006, so this is what, like my 18th year there. Um, I'm kind of the opposite of Daryl in that I'm just all in for one institution. I describe myself as the luckiest comics teacher in the tri-state area <laughs> in that I've got uh, a three-class course load plus a staff position, which adds up to a full-time income, uh, which I love, so I'm kind of the cartoonist who fell in love with his day job. Um, uh, and um, so I've taught in few other places besides SVA, so I'm interested in learning about other teachers' perspectives on teaching so that I can learn more. It's like teachers also want to learn, it turns out. Thank you so much. We can share. I can yell. Yeah. Yeah. OK, I'll hog this mic. Um, so I guess I kind of wanted to start off um, by hearing a bit about all of your like journeys into becoming educators. Like, Did you envision yourselves always being teachers? Or 
Is that something that like you kind of stumbled into? Um, yeah. Mm. Uh, if I project from my diaphragm, people can hear me? Oh, that's <laughs> good, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, actually my parents are all academics. Oh. Uh, yeah, so I, for a long time I ran screaming from the family business and then when you hit middle age you realize you're a little bit more like your parents than you expected. <laughs> um, so yeah, I started teaching. Um, it, it, it sort of fell into my lap. I came into um, CCA as they were building this um, MFA and comics program and, um, and just sort of fell in love with teaching comics. I, it uh, scratches my little, um, uh, the inner high school theater queen um, that, <laughs> that uh, it needs to be on stage, you know, so that's, because uh, it's performance, right? A, a big part of teaching is performance. Um, so that's really been gratifying. And then I love sort of, um, you know, paying forward because I feel like I've gotten a lot of wonderful mentorship over, over, the t over time. And, um, and um, I, I, I'm a big fan of comics history. I did a, a book called No Straight Lines, Four Decades of Queer Comics, and then produced a film like that and uh, of the same name. And um, teaching a comics history class is really wonderful because I get to, this is a new field and it's something that, um, uh, where the canon hasn't been solidified in a ways that um, have been true of other art forms. And so I get to be part of the conversation of figuring out uh, what books matter, what voices matter, how to bring in marginalized voices that are oftentimes outside of the canon. Um, that's been really, really gratifying. So, yeah. um, I, started, uh, I started teaching when I was in undergrad. Actually, I went to, I was an older student, uh, as we call them, returning students. Uh, I had, uh, and I went to the School of the Art Institute, and I had already had like some time under my belt as doing a bunch of things. Uh, I grew up in that age where if you really, if you knew how to use a Macintosh, you were suddenly a graphic designer. Uh -huh. um, and so I like had a lot of experience with that stuff. So I was really lucky while I was at uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago that I was able to uh, teach at Columbia down the street. Um, uh, and I uh, had very rewarding teaching experiences there. And then when I went to grad school, it was on a actual uh, teaching scholarship. Like our program was about teaching. Well, well our, our program was like, we will pay for you to go to school, but you have to teach. And uh, because I'm an overachiever, I was like, well, what if I taught more while I was there? Uh, so I ended up teaching a, a higher load than I was supposed to. I wasn't supposed to teach more than two classes a semester, and I ended up teaching three. Um, and uh, and UNLV, I see you right there. Yeah, uh, the cohort before mine. Um, and then uh, in my second MFA, because I'm a weirdo and I did two MFAs, <laughs> uh, at Duke, I actually got the chance for the first time to teach, because I'd been teaching graphic design, and I got the chance for the first time to teach comics at Duke to a bunch of incredibly rich people. Uh, who at the end of the class, I was like, you know, they were like talking about like, oh, I'm gonna go work for Google and I'm gonna go work for Deloitte Touche. And I'm like, thank you, support the arts, please buy me things. <laughs> um, and uh, I was really uh, then very excited about teaching comics. I was really lucky when I got out of grad school um, because I had such a wide uh, um, uh, resume, like I, like I said, I had been working before I went to school in design, so I had a big design background, and then I just did a bunch of stuff when I got out of undergrad in comics, and like had this, you know, 20 year career in comics. Um, and then when I went to grad school, or and after I got out of grad school, uh, I like did the unheard of, and I got like three teaching gigs. Uh, like three full-time offers. And I decided to go to Columbus because I wanted to teach there. Theirs was the most interesting. It wasn't in Pittsburgh, Kansas, which is one of the other places I got. Sorry, Emmy, if you're here. Um, and uh, then I, uh, and I, it was foundations. And I was really excited about teaching foundations because I love a freshman. Um, uh, because they're just tiny little moldable minds and they're like very excited about everything and everything is happening to them for the first time. Um, I didn't ever think I was going to be administration. Mm. Like that was this, like, I was like, I am a teacher. I love teaching, teaching rules. And they're like, but what if you ran it? And I was <laughs> like, oh, tell me more of this running it. Um, and that has become very rewarding to me because I get to uh, 
I get to make the program that I always wanted when I was in undergrad, because I graduated and was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, I have no idea how to make money at this. I have no idea what the point of any of the last four years have been. Um, and I felt really lost. And I, I, well, I still, everyone is still very lost when they graduate uh, from undergrad. I am like, but at least here is a way to pay back your student loans, right? Here is a way to job. And I'm very firm about like that our, our program is like, this is how to be a working artist in comics. And it was because I got to design the program to be that way. And that's like the rewarding thing of being a chair. So you're like this, I get to do this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, so the, the question is like, how do we get into teaching? Yes. Okay. Um, so I was drawing comics just kind of alone in my room for many years um, and working at coffee shops and making money that way. And it was not sustainable emotionally, financially, <laughs> mentally. Um, I wanted something more fulfilling uh, for a day job. So I, um, after I finished my first book, it was like I had a mental breakdown basically because I was so isolated. I felt disconnected from the world and I applied to CCS not to learn how to like, not really as much to like learn how to draw comics because I thought I was kind of cocky about knowing how to draw comics at that point, but I wanted to learn how to teach comics. So I was, it was kind of like a meta experience. I was studying how the teachers were teaching their courses, how they structured their curriculum. Um, and then I started, when I was a student at CCS, I started leading the kids comics program, which I still lead, called Cartoon Club. And uh, I realized, oh, from I don't actually wanna focus on teaching um, in a, at a university level or to like people who are professionally interested in being cartoonists. Primarily, I'm more interested in teaching like kids and people who just like wanna like, like, pe like just like everyday people who wanna make things. Um, and uh, so that's kind of been my focus. Um, although I do also um, advise a lot of students at CCS who want to be professional cartoonists. Um, and uh, my favorite thing, though, is working with children because um, maybe it's just because I am secretly a child inside. <laughs> um, I just I love the way kids make comics, the way they think that is, like kids under the age of 12, especially are just not critical of themselves in the way that once they get older, um, they can be and love to steal their ideas. Um, <laughs> so. Um, what I find interesting about this question is that I think for many cartoonists who might be in the room prior to a certain date in time, they weren't taught how to make comics. They taught themselves. They learned from their friends who made comics. And that was my experience. I didn't go through a formal program start to finish. This is what a comic is. This is how you make it. I taught myself. I created um, a pathway based on my curiosity and finally came to SOAR because I was like, I've reached a wall, I need help. Um, so my way in was very informal. It was very peer-to-peer. -peer. It was often in community settings. It was probably people like you who were kind of looking for ways to connect and had knowledge, had skills, but didn't always have an outlet to share them. And so SOAR was really appealing to me in that way because we are community focused where our, our priority is the student in the room. Tom created the program after teaching at SVA, at other schools, and recognizing the power of coming together in one place. But that place being um, unavailable to a lot of people for different reasons. And so financial reasons, geographic re reasons shouldn't stop you from connecting with other people who share your passion and have knowledge, have skills. Um, so that was my way in. I, I got to see the benefit of that, and I just wanted to give a little bit back to that as well. I think uh, teaching comics comes naturally to me because it's easier than making comics. <laughs> most most so, things are easier than making comics. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, giving so, blood is easier than making comics. Yeah, it's, in a way, it's almost the path of least resistance just for me personally. Um, because like working, making comics is often very solitary, and uh, you know, working in front of an audience, you know, since the teacher-student relationship is per like performer and audience, 
you get instant feedback and instant positive reinforcement, you know, when they laugh at your stupid jokes or, <laughs> or uh, you know, like even just nods like that, that like, oh yeah, I get it. I get what you're saying. It's like that gives you an, a teacher the, a little endorphin kick. Um, so uh, yeah, that just, it makes it easier. Um, uh, but I think also it's very much a personality thing. Like teachers are people who want to share information and like, as soon as I learn something new, I'm like, oh, how can I share that with my students? And I kind of have to remind myself, like, slap myself on the wrist, like, no, no, your first priority is to take that and integrate it into your own comics work. It's like, don't be so generous all the time. Like, <laughs> give yourself some artistic permission to be selfish for a while. And once you've integrated it, then share it with the students, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, and so, like, Justin also, like, my dad is a teacher. And so uh, having, having that kind of, like, desire to share information uh, is must be sort of, he must have modeled that behavior for me, so I picked it up. All right, thank you so much, everyone. I have so many directions to go now that are competing in my head, but um, I think where I will start is uh, kind of picking up on something you said, Justin, um, about uh, you know being able to pave the way on what a comics curriculum even looks like, um, because um, it is a very DIY and uh, kind of self-taught medium for, for many, many people. Um, and there are things that we consider like canon to teaching comics, uh, like Scott McCloud's work. Um, but um, I'd be curious to hear from anyone who wants to answer, like, how did you go about developing your curriculum and um, how have you kind of honed it over time and what are your priorities there? I was super lucky when I started that um, Emmy Guinness started with me, and uh, we wrote, I had a, a partner to write the comics curriculum with, so we could bounce ideas off of each other. Um, and we had, you know, uh, as many comics programs are, there had, we had been uh, nurtured within the bosom of illustration, and, uh, and then broke off. Um, and so like I was, there were classes I inherited <laughs> that I was like, okay, I have to now take this class, which was a person who had a, a totally different way of seeing comics to what we're thinking of for our program and try and, and fit that in. So there was like mm -hmm. a, a little jigsaw puzzle thing going on. Um, but um, there was a lot of reading and going back and forth with each other about like, do you like this Ivan Brunetti thing? Well, I like this Jessica Abel thing, but then also what if this? And then also what if that? And, um, and also, yes, understanding comics. Uh -huh. And then where do we put it? And how do we talk about it? And, um, you know, and it's great that there's a lot more like comics, like making literature now too. Yeah. Right? Um, that there didn't, yeah. That, that, that again, yeah, it was very much like, figure this out on your own. And now we're like, but what if this? Um, so yeah, that was, that was kind of our way of doing it. It was, a, it, was, it, was, it was a collaborative experience. It has stayed a collaborative experience. Like everything I write, I write with my uh, faculty. Like mm -hmm. we, nobody like, I don't come up, down from on a high and say, we will now have a class on this. Mm -hmm. I will suggest classes, they will suggest classes, we talk them out. So, to yeah. make the program like kind of as a whole more, yeah. more robust. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so like, yeah, so we used to be also like more partnered with liberal arts uh, in that the liberal, like we had six credit classes, mm -hmm. which as everyone knows, that's a lot of class. Mm -hmm. And so we were like, okay, we're gonna bust off from liberal arts and have more classes available to students. Um, but we are, like, writing is a real big part of our program. I mean, it's a big part of comics. It's a big part of everyone's program. But, like, we're like, no, writing, so much writing. Um, and uh, so we're having entire classes now about comics writing. Okay. And, um, and also, like, we have a lot of minors from other majors. Like, we have a lot of animation mi majors who are comics minors, illustrations, et cetera. And with them, it's also like, okay, it's not storyboarding, you guys. And like having to like kind of figure out how to fit those minors into the classes as mm -hmm. well. So mm -hmm. yeah, I feel like that was very scattered, but yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason, I saw that you had. Um, yeah, so, uh, so Lauren, I feel like you were talking about curriculum, which means like what's taught across the whole 
bunch of classes by different teachers. Mm -hmm. And so I don't actually have total authority over career. I guess we, it's good for the sake of the audience to sort of like break it down. We've got two department chairs mm -hmm. at the end and then one sort of like advisor to the chair. So the chair is Victor Cohen, uh, who's the chair of illustration and comics at SVA. And then do you have an administrative role? Yeah, I'm a program director, both online and in person. Okay. And so I have input on curriculum, but not authority for curriculum. And so you two at the end have authority for curriculum, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, um, and so Daryl, do you have a role in, in that kind of thing too? I mean, I'm just in charge of myself. <laughs> okay, <good. laughs> I'm just a free agent. Okay, cool. Yeah. And so we can, so like if, yeah. if each of us is not an authority on curriculum, we can talk about like syllabus, I guess, mm -hmm. too. And so the, the original question was like, um, like uh, how do you originate syllabus or curriculum? Like where does it come from? Yeah, yeah. I guess for me, it all came out of my Ed, <laughs> like, like, in, here, here's how to make comics, and and since comics is like very, um, like stages of process are really kind of clearly delineated. That is this beautiful uh, structure that you can then translate to a teaching strategy too. Um, and there's also like the um, modular and car compartmentalized nature of comics, like. Uh, um, you know, words within balloons, within panels, within pages, within chapters, within comic books, within graphic novels, within graphic novel series. And so um, that's also a structural thing that translates beautifully to a teaching situation. So uh, so I made it all up myself. And, <laughs> and, and then I discovered the famous artists uh, correspondence course materials which completely validated all of my <laughs> teaching decisions. How fortunate. Having been written like 40 years earlier. And so it's like, oh, I guess, I guess that's just the intuitive way to do it that most people kind of come to. Um, so that felt pretty good. Um, I, I would just say like uh, in terms of curriculum, sort of pulling back a bit again, um, uh, the, the interesting challenge of having an MFA in comics program is that most of our uh, students do not come in with a BFA in comics. So if you had an MFA in sculpture or painting, you can sort of assume that the majority of your students would be, have a BFA in that particular form, and that's not true with comics. So, and also comics are incredibly interdisciplinary and uh, with a huge number of skill sets, right? So the teaching of all that stuff is incredibly daunting at a, at a MFA level to, um, to try to, to, to do that. Because we have, and the, the, the range of experiences of people coming in. Some people were coming into our program have had years of experience uh, making comics and some have never made a comic before, you know, sort of at that beginning stage. Um, but demonstrate you know, incredible skill or you know, passion in some, in some form. So um, tailoring that has been interesting. Uh, the, the core of our program is one-on-one uh, -on -one mentorships. So that's the way that we sort of handle a lot of the stuff where a lot of the specific skills that might be necessary for a given student can be handled by that faculty member. Um, and then also we, we also want to think of and this was something very important to me because, and we, this is something we could talk about, but you know, the ethics around higher education, where um, <laughs> Lauren's favorite subjects. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, I, you know, we're asking for a lot of time and resources and money from students to to come into these programs, and it's, you know, I I went and I got my BFA in uh, printmaking and literature with a minor in women's studies, all super awesome, like, you know, <laughs> very job applicable, <laughs> and I floundered because I didn't get a single class in how to the business of making art or how to uh, construct a, a portfolio or how to uh, approach an agent, and nothing. And um, even my MFA was like that in creative writing. So we're not gonna let that happen. Like that was, you know, so we have a robust professional practice. We have a pedag pedagogy class um, as well. So how to teach comics. Um, so that's a whole other set of things to teach, right? So juggling all this stuff is extremely complicated, um, but um, that's the challenge. And in terms of um, on my uh, more individual uh, sense of as a teacher, I, I taught different, aspects of comics making, but the thing that I do regularly is comics history. And it's an interesting uh, uh, topic because there are no uh, um, there are no textbooks on comics history, yeah. right? Yeah, they're making <laughs> yes, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, 
Um, so you're, I'm pulling out of my ass, I mean, to Jason's point. <laughs> um, uh, but you, know, you, tr you need to be a generalist in comics history. So oftentimes I'll have students come in who know more about shoujo manga than I do, mm -hmm. for example, right? But I, what I have is a sort of generalist uh, uh, conception of how comics play out globally that mm -hmm. is pretty unusual um, because it's hard to find people who sort of think of comics as a larger phenomenon. Right. And that's what's necessary for a, a generalist class like that. So, yeah. yeah we <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, would you, were you guys going to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I would love to hear from uh, Daryl about um, developing a curriculum for specifically kids. Oh, um, sure. um, it's very different. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, so I inherited a curriculum from like the previous person who ran the kids' comics program, but I realized as I got more confident as a teacher that our styles were very different, um, and I was... Like, like there were a lot of worksheets and um, like directed activity. And I just thought, you know, kids' art's beautiful on its own. I wanted to just see it without my art or any interference on the page. So it became a lot more about reading the room. Um, and it, so honestly, there's not a lot of planning. <laughs> it's, it's like I, I, there's like an idea of, of what I'll do on a particular class. And then it's, yeah, it's like I'm kind of, it's kind of, you have to deal with chaos when you're I just, I, I literally um, just whispered, that is terrifying yeah. to me. No, and, and, I, and when I was starting off, I was even afraid to talk in front of a room full of. Thank you, sorry. Oh, you were feeding back. Oh, sorry. Um, and, and talk in front of a room full of people. Um, and, uh, so by the time, now once I became more confident in, in like being with a room full of children, it became just about like, what are the, I would listen to like, what are they talking about today? And then, uh. um, and then I would like, they're, they're all talking about like being, I, they would have recess before and I'd hear what they were talking about in the playground and like what they were playing. And then I would like think of a, of a class um, and then we would like make a comic class based around um, magic or something. Uh, so it became, it be, it's become much more organic and like just like getting to know the kids and what they're interested in on a case by case basis. And this is also true for MFA level students that I work with because I mostly deal with one on one thesis advising. Um, so every um, advisee that I have is like, they want a completely different relationship with me than the last person I worked with. Some people want a coach, some people want, um, me to just tell them that they're doing a good job, you know? Um, so, and some people like want homework. So it's like, it, I always ask and like try to like negotiate what our relationship is and check in and make sure that, um, that they're getting what they need out of the relationship. Um, and that's yeah. at, that's at CCS with the MFA program there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I can speak to this, I guess. Um, so we're pretty- Oh, you were too I'm feedback too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Try that one. Speak right, up. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> From the chest. Um, so we're pretty fortunate at SOAR. Like I mentioned previously, uh, the people in the room direct what we're focusing on. Mm. And we often make a call out to our community, what do you want to be learning? And they respond. Mm. And based on those responses, we reach out to our pool of instructors or facilitators and ask, is anyone interested in kind of creating a class around this? And so, um, we have a few different formats that we teach in. We have something styled like the first year of an MFA program. It's a nine month long course. It's meant to give you all the skills to make comics start to finish. Um, I think it's modeled off some of you know the, the sheets that you mentioned previously, Jason. Um, and that is a place where there is a lot of um, containment. There are boundaries created. It's, it's led by different uh, professional cartoonists but there is a structure. On the other end of that, we offer four-week courses online um, that are focused on a specific skill or idea, and that is a space where the instructor is responding to who's in the room. We trust our instructors. Um, we don't have a lot of kind of supervision of what's going on in that space, and we're trying to create an open door where both the instructor can come to us, but so can, so can the students, um, and create a space that is safe, um, is playful, and like the outcome isn't as important as the experience. Um, many people who come through our programs are people who've been deterred in other settings, who've been discouraged, and our kind of mission is to make sure that 
they leave our spaces or they continue in our spaces with confidence and like a appreciation for the fact that wherever they are at, whatever they want to do is valuable. Um, we're not promising them a career at the end of it. We're not committing to um, some kind of outcome. We're really invested in the process and that looks really different for everyone. And that means that we're putting out a lot of fires all the time, but in a really rewarding way where we're seeing that people keep coming back. Um, and we're trying to facil facil uh, facilitate a space for instructors as well. Like you all are describing a pretty intensive process for like a overall course. As um, creators, as instructors, there should also be room for play. So we're trying to figure out what does that look like um, outside of institutional settings? How can we support people in developing material and content for students and for other instructors and kind of pool our resources? Because there are programs across the country that are doing similar things, doing the same thing, and we're all creating it kind of siloed. And there is an opportunity for us to connect to kind of share what we're doing and, and not kind of invent the wheel every time. Can I just say that um, Saw has a really great Friday night comics program. Um, it's, it's free, it's online every Friday. It's been going on since the beginning of the pandemic and it is like really great for teachers and students because I, I taught a class there and it was like a nice way to like really be creative about teaching. So, and it's really fun. It's a, like, there's like a ongoing community, so. No, absolutely. We have a community of almost 4,000 people. Um, that's not just here in the United States, that is across the world um, and those workshops are recorded, they're available on YouTube. We have over 90 now, um, and we do get a lot of feedback from instructors at every level, whether you're working with kids, whether you're working with adults. That's a really valuable resource just to kind of get people feeling good and <laughs> feeling playful. So I would recommend checking that out. I also have a bunch of material with me, so if at the end you want any information, I have it here. Can I, can I add on to what you were saying, Emma? Please. You used the word siloed, and to me that's like, the worst possible situation for any kind of like learning community, whether it's like local or like international. Uh, and so, um, do you all remember NACE, the N A C A E, the National Association of Comic Art Educators? No. Oh God, no. That's no. A, so it was a James. <laughs> Durham, what, a, what a terrible. <laughs> I know. It's, <laughs> they say, say, it's hilarious. Say no. Yeah. Oh, and so James Durham well. founded this before he founded uh, CCS. Oh, okay. Uh, and because he was teaching <laughs> and, at SCAD. And learned about acronyms. Yeah, he was teaching <laughs> at SCAD, and he was feeling siloed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I needed something so I can like share ideas with other mm -hmm. comics teachers. And yeah. so it was like a website that was like a, um, a resource thing. So you could upload your syllabus, you could upload your lesson plans, yeah. exercises. Okay. And so, you know, you could see like, oh, here's like Ivan Brunetti's exercise before he did his book. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really cool. And then at some point he founded CCS and then uh, they say disappeared. <laughs> yeah. And so I want it back. Uh, <laughs> I would love some kind of web or some kind of internet tool that would allow us to like share all that stuff. Because, you know, I've, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sharing information with students, but I would love to share information with other comics teachers in a way that transcends the institutional mm -hmm. boundaries. Yeah, it's, it's, there are some people who are like super like my syllabus mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like very like, mm. and um, I've always been like, uh, I, there's um, uh, uh, Sean Knickerbocker is teaching at a uh, um, school in Minnesota, has a comics program, oh, starts with an M. MCAD. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, yeah Minneapolis uh, College of Art and Design. Yeah, yeah, and uh, was asking, uh, Marina Harkness about uh, her experience teaching at CCAD and Marina was like, hey, Sh Sean's teaching these classes, do you have any uh, thoughts? And I was like, yeah, have all of these syllabi, have mm -hmm. all of these classes I've taught because it's not like, it doesn't take anything away from me to, to, mm -hmm. to share the information. It would be lovely to have a bigger thing like that. I, I mean, it is intellectual property. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah. So you have I to, mean, don't just take my name right, off right, it. Right, <laughs> right. it has be to be like, consensual, but yeah. yeah, but, yeah. I, but I, but I, <laughs> 
<laughs> but I do. I know. I agree, though. Like, I mean, it, I we, I think it's a vested interest we all have to yeah. sort of make comics education get better and better. You know, generationally, sort of mm-hmm. improve upon itself. And we, it, this is still a really new form and a really new um, uh, educational platform, right? So yeah. uh, we get better with with, and that's that's a good thing as a community. Com- mm-hmm. Comics history people. Who was the first comics program in the country? Was it SCAD? No, it was probably Bryn Hogarth's. Oh, okay, uh, no, 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 yeah. professional, yeah. No, 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 but like, right. with, like through a through a college, through an institution, or like an accredited, an institutional, an accredited. Yeah, I well, think that see, is SCAD. S- I think it's SCAD. S- SVA was accredited in '57 oh, or something right. like that. Well, for comics. Yeah, because there was a yeah, cartooning cause... major then. Holy yeah. crap! Yeah. 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 You guys Bur- win. Bur- 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 yeah. Hogarth, because yeah. Bern Bur- Bur- Hogarth, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, but he left shortly after that. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did the did the did the program stick around? Well, it it came and went. I mean, it was the mm-hmm. school for cartoonists and illustrators mm-hmm. as of like 1943, and it was mostly GI Bill students. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And God, then uh, in the early 50s with the Red Scare and the um, Joe, Joe McCarthy yeah. uh, anti-communism thing. I think both Hogarth and Silas Rhodes were like accused of having pinko uh, <laughs> uh, feelings. Mm-hmm. And so at that point, they wanted to distance themselves from comic yeah, yeah. books, which were a juvenile delinquency uh, yeah. thing. And so they then saw it to become like a more conventional accredited art school. Mm. So, and, so, and then the comics or the cartooning major sort of like became hidden. And then over the following decades, it kind of like crawled itself back to life mm. in, the, in the school. J- Jason, can we have our, the, the uh, instead of say nay or whatever it is, can, oh, just na- pink, naysay, right? Naysay, can we call it pinko feelings? <laughs> yes. Like, I, 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 <laughs> I like I pinko that. feelings. Yeah, I feel like that's sort of. Yeah, I was like, I'm like, oh, art teachers with pinko feelings. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a very that'll be an involved acronym though. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty <laughs> right. interesting. Yeah. 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 Yes. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, so this will likely be my last question before um, I open the floor to the audience. Um, so, so what will I ask? Oh um, no. I you have a very very intense this is the a very long I, I really wildly good. overprepared but <laughs> good uh, job <laughs> um, but I guess I guess what I'll ask then to close pr- probably close my portion out um, is I would love to hear what uh, your recommendations are to uh, people in the audience who are interested in becoming educators themselves mm-hmm. or perhaps they already teach um, what are, are things that you would like to have known or would like to pass along? Mm. I mean, figure out like what you want to teach, right? If you want to teach college, it's one path. Mm. If you want to teach, mm-hmm. if you want to be the shining example <laughs> of freelance awesomeness, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a different path. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's my two cents. What's yours? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I, there's a snowballing effect that's happening, which is really wonderful, where institutions are starting to realize that every time you put up a comics class, it gets filled. Yeah. So, so pitch, pitch your classes. Go, yeah. to, go to institutions and actually say, hey, I want to start a comics class. Go to the local library. Yeah. Get your Check and see if they have way. one already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, stuff on people's toes. But yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, libraries, uh, workshops yeah. at, at bookstores, that's how I sort of hone my skills yeah. initially. And you, that's how you get stuff on your CV and you get uh, uh, classroom sort of experience. Uh, and then you can take that to institutions and, and pitch the idea of, of starting classes in these, um, uh, which again, they get filled. Another thing is that you can use this to, to travel. Yeah. Right. So, like the Fulbright was, they. I was then on after doing it. I was on the panel uh, looking through projects, and like they are really interested in comics, right? Because it's interdisciplinary. It's sort of we're we're, we're hot right now, <laughs> actually, <laughs> hot cartoonist summer. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so so yeah. I mean, uh, we can we can travel with this stuff um, and teach in other places. So. I taught in a Buddhist university in, in northern Thailand, a comics to, to Buddhist monks, a comics program, which was like, OK, um, uh, so, so do that, too. Yeah, visiting artist residencies are a real thing. Yeah. Like, that, like you can, you know, especially once you start to build up your portfolio, you can just, I knew somebody who literally just went from residency to residency Ooh. all over the world. 
and, uh, and didn't live anywhere for like three years. Um, I could not have done that. I like my dogs <laughs> and my partner. So, um, but like, if you've got that kind of lifestyle, please do that. Like, enjoy if you that. Don't that like that your experience. dogs and your partner. Right. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although I did, I did apply to a residency that said, "Are you bringing a dog?" And I was like, "That's a that's a thing I can do." Yes. <laughs> um, so, two things. First. Um, this is more like the spiritual advice, uh, is to meet people where they're at. So mm -hmm. um, mm. you, uh, whether you feel confident in like the knowledge that you have, like always know like you're always going to not know enough. Um, and that mm -hmm. the way that you can be a good teacher is by like really listening to someone else and being receptive and f feeling out what they need from the experience. Um, and that's re regardless of whether you're teaching, like you're actually like providing information and content to your students or whether you're trying to help them hone skills um, in a particular, in, in the medium. Uh, so that's that's the first thing. And that's regardless of age too or what, what they want. Um, uh, second thing is to advocate for yourself because whether you're a freelancer or you're working for an institution, no, like you're gonna be the one who cares the most about whether you're making enough money, um, yeah. and no one else is going to. <laughs> um, so, so you you need to advocate for yourself. You need to know what you're worth. Like you need to know what you how much money you need to survive, um, and you need to make sure that's what you're getting. Um, and thrive. And thrive. Yes, yeah. certainly a thriving ideal. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, um, and like. And it may feel weird to like ask for a certain amount of money when you're starting out, but it's not. And like every teacher in the world is underpaid. So just remember that. Yeah. I feel like, do you need to have a master's degree to teach is an important question to ask. Mm -hmm. And at, so at, have, at, at the at the like college yeah. level, yeah. So mm -hmm. how many of us have master's degrees? I'm lowering my hand. Unaccredited. Everybody, everybody <laughs> except me. Yeah. 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 So do you have to have a master's degree to teach in New York City? Not really. Well, okay, adjunct teaching is always going to be the exception, right? Right. Cuz 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 the the poor poor MF, the poor adjunct masses. Yeah. You know, are uh but you guys also have the largest adjunct pool in the world. Yes. Yeah. Um is going to be that like um yeah, but like if you are a person who is like I would like to do the tenure track thing, or the, the non-tenure track thing, um, or you know, work at that kind of institution, you do, you do need to have the institutional, either that or you need to have the most amazing resume because mm -hmm. an accredited body is gonna have to make the argument for everybody who doesn't meet the accreditation standard. Mm. I see. So we were also speaking to programs that are fairly new, comparatively. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. SBA has a really wonderful history of bringing in artists who don't have like formal authority, I do think it isn't like a different case for a lot of people who are coming into programs that have been having to mm -hmm. demand their worth, have been having to demonstrate that it's valid. Mm -hmm. And so that is, that's a part of the question. It's not just the place, like geographically, New York, it's, it's the institution as well and the organization. I just wanna make that clear yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's also like, um, uh, it, because it's such a new field, there are very few people with terminal degrees in comics, right? So, so it's, it creates a very tricky thing. So for, for us, for example, we, we want to you know, have people with terminal degrees because it, again, for accreditation issues, it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. However, there, you know, unless we're hiring our own students, there's very few people with MF, which we can't also do because of accreditation. We don't want that also, but it creates an incestuous sort of feeling. So um, we have to, it's really, it's really tricky like to find people with, with all of those um, criteria met. You know, professional practice, yeah. uh, a cartooning experience, and also uh, a teaching experience, and also the terminal degree. Yeah, like I don't have an MFA in comics. Yeah. I don't have a BFA in comics. Yeah. Um, but my two faculty members mm -hmm. and the one faculty member that I steal from illustration all the time mm -hmm. all have MFAs in comics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so follow-up question to that. So if you, if you want to hire somebody as a teacher and they're a really accomplished cartoonist, mm -hmm. can you make a case for them, even if they don't have an MFA, to put them on your faculty? Yes. Okay, good. But it, it, it is tricky. It, with is, it becomes yeah. like... You know, and my institution is right now like really putting the kibosh on it. Oh, like right. I yeah. like like there are 
I can't hire anybody from CCS. Mm -hmm. I can't hire anybody uh, who, unless that person has won an Eisner, yeah. and I am willing to like have a year-long fight with my provost, mm -hmm. I can't make an argument for hiring somebody who doesn't have an MFA into a permanent position. Mm -hmm. The thing is, like, there are pe there, the, the on the other hand, like I know other people with MFAs, so it's like okay, I don't have to make that argument because as much as I love this person and would love to have them work for me permanently in a full-time position. It's gonna be different for uh, like, cause there's also like different level of adjuncts, the what I call mm -hmm. the super adjuncts, the instructors, the visiting lecturers, stuff like that. That is, you can have a BFA, right? Because you're not tenure track, yeah. you're not, um, you're not doing school service. Mm -hmm. You're not participating in curriculum building. You're mm -hmm. not doing like all of the things that are like faculty things. And so then they're like, yeah, super faculty, mm -hmm. right? But, and they get paid better than adjuncts and they have healthcare. healthcare. Mm -hmm. But uh, they don't have the long contracts that faculty members have, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe so. we should, can we just get a show of hands? How many of you are currently comics teachers or interested in becoming comics mm -hmm. teachers? Quite a few. Wow. Actually. All right. So these are valuable. <laughs> I like that you both, you both looked at each other and you were like, "Sure, okay." <laughs> <laughs> so, so, are you are you like, "Oh, geez, I guess I have to get an MFA." Is it okay? All right, interesting. Um, so we're uh, we're running low on time, so I want to make sure we get some audience questions in. Um, if you have a question, depending on which half of the room you're in, there is a mic in either aisle. Please, scurry to the mics. <laughs> yeah. <I'd... laughs> or just... You could also talk to any of us. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. And all, we all have a table, have people tables, with tables yeah. here. So my students are tabling mm -hmm. at C3. Uh, w13, uh, um, so yeah. And I think for these to get as many in with the time we have yeah. left as possible, mm -hmm. let's not have like everybody. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, let's start on the, over here. Hi, thank you for this panel. This is fantastic. Um, I don't consider myself a teacher in the formal sense. I work in news and I coach uh, reporters through writing comics journalism. Um, so I'm really interested in particularly Daryl and from Sequential Artist Workshop, I didn't catch your name. Emma, hi. <laughs> Emma, hi. Good to meet you. Um, I'm interested to hear from you all as folks who interact with non-cartoonists, teaching them about making comics and those kinds of principles. What what kind of philosophies do you use um, with non-visual folks, perhaps, or um, just kind of people who are outside the, the discipline as a, as a whole? You can go if you want. Um, so it's, it's very like intro to comics. Like I, um, I, I basically like walk them through what the, the found like the fundamentals of the medium are like this is a gutter this is a panel um, we do a lot of like level the playing field exercises so that it's less about the drawing skill and more about like conveying information in the most simplified clear way as clearest way possible um, so it's a lot it's a lot of like um, just like that's like what I focus on at like at the very beginning when I'm working with people who have never drawn comics before getting them to understand that it's not like illustrated writing, um, it's using symbols and like like the this like the simplest imagery and to convey information basically. Um, and you, stick figures are fine. Um, so um, I ba I make a lot of exercises based around that particular skill. Um. We come, well, we have a lot of students come to us expecting there's a secret in comics, and there is no secret. Um, <laughs> the secret is you make them, um, which is the hardest part, but it's also the easiest. I think all of the people on the panel, all of the cartoonists in the room will um, agree that you learn through doing. Um, so giving people permission to create is kind of the biggest act of freedom for them. It can be stick figures, it can be that like focus on just the fundamental information and words are okay in comics. Like <laughs> start from that place, start from the skill that you already have and build from there. Um, I'm surprised it hasn't already been said. Linda Barry is a great resource mm -hmm. for that. Um, jump into making comics. Starting from that place and, and going forward is, is really useful. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Thank you so much. All right, let's hop to the other side of the room. Hi, um, this question applies to everybody. Um, if this happens to you, how do you deal with imposter syndrome, mm. being both an artist oh. and an educator? Right. And if it doesn't happen to you, or if it also happens, um, how do you navigate that with your students? I feel like this comes back to your teaching as performance comment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, no, it doesn't. I mean, I think everybody has it. Right? I mean, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> Never. Um, so, so, and, and I, I think you just have to sort of barrel through it and, and you know, fake it till you make it. Um, you, and, and at act, some point. Act as if. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it, at some point it does sort of settle down. Um, I used to have panic attacks every time uh, before, uh, the night before every class that I would teach mm -hmm. and like not be able to, to sleep. Um, and now I don't. Like I don't really, it's okay now. I, you, and it sort of happens almost you don't even notice it and suddenly you're not panicking anymore. Um, so just doing it a bunch of times, and I, I don't think there's any other way around it. Just you just kind of take the deep breath and pretend until you're not pretending. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, like all of us are in the encouragement business. Yeah. I, I feel like teachers really need to be nurturers primarily. Mm -hmm. And so we have to give copious positive reinforcement and tell the students how proud we are of them, like a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, knowing that I feel like the medium kind of attracts a very sensitive personality in a way, and I think we need a lot of that reinforcement. Yeah. Um, uh, and also steer the students towards therapy. Yeah. Because <laughs> I, I feel like there's, there's only... Everybody, just everybody. There's, there's only so much that we can do in the yeah. you know, one yeah. to three hours we have with them yeah. once or twice a week. And uh, like, that's a topic that should be worked out with a professional too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can, can I also, can we all, do we all agree that like almost every comics classroom is a very mixed experience? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Classroom, there's always gonna be people who are like already pro right. in ability yeah. and that there are, will always be people who are just kind of stumbling into the medium for the first time with very limited mm. experience and skills in yeah. place like um, and, that can and be so those people those people need a lot of reinforce yeah. like positive reinforcement just to get them up to right. speed so but that can be tremendously exciting too like that's one of the advantages right where you will have people coming in who are like writers right and they don't really have, don't understand the sort of visual elements and then the, the, the opposite right or um, and, and even in a sort of undergraduate uh, set, I've had fiber arts people come in and like make like stuff I never thought of as comics before mm -hmm. so that can be really exciting uh, and, and it can bolster each other's confidence right mm -hmm. I want to answer that question directly just by saying um, conversation and curiosity is really valuable in the classroom although you might be at the front of it may, although you might be performing there are other people in the room, ask questions, um, allow other people time to speak, to share, and help them recognize that platform. And in doing that, it helps you recognize like your value in that place as well. Mm -hmm. That's been my experience. Yeah. Can we take um, two more questions? No, unfortunately, we have to wrap up now. Um, I but saw the wall yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can remaining question askers, can you talk to us in the hallway? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. please. And anyone no, else? Yeah, yeah, let's yeah. let's take this outside. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can announce your table numbers? Yeah, where's your yeah. table numbers? Um, sequential Artist Workshop, we're at D14. Our banner got broken, but we're right in the middle of the room. Look for the balloon. We'll be there. I'm not at a table. I'm walking around, so just touch me and tell me. <laughs> ask me questions. Um, that sounds good. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>